Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sakum Sales. I am the Petty Third District Director of um, Budget and Finance. Um, well, welcome, everybody, to our training for PTA um, Tax Tolling based Basics. And we hope to provide enough information, everything that you guys need to mind your um, easy regarding PTSA tax feelings. And well, today we will be discussing, focusing on Okay, focusing on PTA making less than 50,000, but we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, okay, please make sure you are muted during the presentation and please ask questions in the chat. We will try to answer as many possible during today's training. Okay, um, our team today includes uh, Lisa Ujamatsu, she's the 33rd District PTA Tax and Governmental Filling Consultant. Uh, Donna Howland, she's the 33rd District PTA Treasurer. Rita Rivera, 33rd District PTA Financial Secretary. And Annette Nolan, 33rd District PTA Director of Leadership. All righty, I'm gonna go ahead and get this right. Share the screen just so you guys can see, this is one of the handouts that I sent out uh, earlier today. Um, and so this is just a nice overall picture of um, what kind of filings are due and when they're due. So we'll be kind of going over most of these, um, some of them more in depth than others. So there's that. And I'll stop sharing that. And then I'm gonna hop over to the other documents. All right, this also I sent out to you earlier today. Um, so basically in order to do your tax filings, um, you need to have done your, your, your financial reviews first, and then you do your annual financial report covering the period from July 1st, 2022 through June 2023. So there's no real one set way of doing the annual financial report. Um, there are actually uh, three different ways that we have. Um, I know they're really small on the screen, but um, in the, uh, in the uh, handout, you should be able to see it a little bit closer. And actually, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, here we go. Um, so the, the first one on the left-hand side, there's an example of this in the uh, CAPTA website. And so you could download this and use this as a model for your um, annual financial report. Um, if you are in, if you use my PTEZ, they have a budget versus actuals um, report that you can use. And then the actuals would, would show um, what you spent and it's broken down into different categories. And then uh, on our website, we have a, an annual financial report form too. Um, actually the one that's on the website is a little bit old, but it's the same format. You can just change the year on there. So basically what you wanna be doing is breaking it down into different categories. Um, you know, membership dues, the program service revenue, uh, uh, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have enough money to earn interest, um, special events and uh, activities that would be your fundraiser income and other income. So basically, you're splitting it up, and that will help you when you're filling out either your 990 EZ if you make over fifty thousand, or your CTTR one if you make less than. Okay, and then same thing on the bottom. There's a, a breakdown of that. Alrighty, now let me just, oops, sorry, get this to the normal size here. Okay, so in order to do your filings, there's a bunch of numbers that you will need. And fortunately, they're all very handy in your bylaws. So 
Um, if you don't already have a copy of your bylaws, make sure that you ask your parliamentarian for a copy. Um, there are all kinds of numbers on here. Uh, there's your PTA identification number that's issued by CAPTA, the California State PTA. There's also one issued by National PTA. And then here's some important ones. Here's for your federal tax filings. Here's for your state tax filings. Here's your charitable trust renewal, uh, charitable trust number. And then this does not apply to all PTAs, but then there's a, a corporation number for if you are incorporated and need to fill out the SI-100. Okay, so when you're ready to do your tax filings, then you can go to your bylaws in order to get your ident identification numbers, okay? So um, every uh, PTA is required to do federal tax filings. And like we said, we're gonna be focusing on um, those of you who are making less than $50,000 per year. And we'll be going into the, how to do the 990 and the electronic form. If you make more than 50,000, then it's, an, it's a more complicated form um, and even though we're focusing on under 50,000, if there's time, we will go ahead and try and answer any questions you have, okay? Same thing with state tax filings. If you're under 50,000 per year, then there's an electronic form that's really simple. It's called Form 199N. Um, if you make more than 50,000, then it's a slightly more complicated form that's Form 199. Um, let's see. Another form that all PTAs need to fill out is called the RRF1, and that's a uh, state of California form. The attorney general is requiring that all charities renew their charitable trust uh, number. So we'll be going into this form in more detail. And then if you make less than 50,000 and you're filing the 990N, you will also need to fill out a CTTR1. And that uh, is where you break down uh, the types of income and um, expenses that you have. And for B, that's it for now. And then, Nan, are you able to share uh, the, the poll? So can you guys see the poll? We have a, a question to see how much you are paying attention <laughs> at the stuff I was just saying. But the answers are all anonymous, so don't be afraid of making mistakes. And um, so make sure you click all of those that apply, okay? Uh, and we're about 38%, 40, oh, almost 50. Keep them coming, yeah. friends. <laughs> Looks like we're crossing the 62%, 65. They're thinking really hard. I can feel it. Uh, hanging out around 68. Um, if those of you who are maybe phone, you can also put your, you know, if you haven't, thought i guess you could put it in chat if you're unable to participate in the poll uh okay, we're up to 76 percent now all righty i'm just going to go ahead and end the poll here and share results okay is everyone able to see the results okay thank you so here we go let's see how we did which numbers may be found in the bylaws okay yes the the FTB entity number, that's the one for when you're filing your, your state um, tax return. Uh, for some reason, we have raffle permit, permit number twice on here. <laughs> so actually, that is not something that is found in your bylaws. That's something that you actually 
have to, if you want to do a raffle, you would need to apply for it. And then you're assigned a, a raffle number by the state of California. So that one is a no. National PTA number, yes, that's the uh, ID that National PTA um, issues. District PTA number, actually, this one's a, a little bit confusing. Um, I think we had actually meant to to put uh, council PTA number, but yes, on in your bylaws, it's going to tell you what what PTA district you're from, but it's not not going to be on that particular page. So, Internal Revenue Service. EIN number, yes, good, a lot of you got that, all righty. And the charitable trust number, yes, and that is also included in your bylaws, all righty. Now, we're gonna head on over to, um, we're sharing some videos that uh, California State PTA had put together that really walks you through the steps of doing the e-postcards and the RRF1 and the CTTR1. So we'll just be sharing those. Um, if you have any questions while they're um, playing, you can put them in the chat and then we'll get to them after the video is done. Um, just so you know, the this video is, I think, from a year or two ago. So some of the initial setup screens may be different. Um, so hopefully that won't present too much of a problem when you're actually doing it. So, uh, Rita, can you go ahead and share that video? Welcome to Grab and Go PTA, how to file a federal 990N postcard. First things first, you're going to want to gather your materials. You should have the following items before you start. A copy of your annual financial report based on your end of the year financial review, a copy of your bylaws or the tax filing checklist from California State PTA, know your school's complete mailing address, and know your principal officer's complete mailing address. To get to the login page, there is a direct link on the capta.org tax filing support center page or you can Google Form 990 Electronic Filing System and click on the link in the Ready to File section. If you don't have an account already, you'll need to create one on this page. If you already have one, you'll put in your username and then click Login. Once you have your account, you're going to return to that same page and you're either going to click in with the ID me using whatever system you chose to be your identification, or if you already had it in the system from the old IRS version, you will log in picking your site image and then a password. Either way, you will click in sign in or submit and go to the next page. Regardless of which credential system you chose, it does require two-step verification. They will ask you to allow them to text you a six-digit number that you have to put into the system in order to continue. Next, it will show you your login history, all the times recently that you have logged in to file a 990 form. Click Continue. This is the starting point for all e-postcard filings. If you have to make a new postcard filing from a unit you have never used before, or you need to remove some old EINs from your postcard profile, you will click on the Manage e-postcard profile. If you have previously filed, you can still find them under the Manage Form 990N submissions, even if you had an old account and have decided to switch to the real ID version, as long as you use the same email address for both of them. They have updated it to the Manage Form 990N submission page, but when you go back to the Manage E postcard profile, your EIN numbers will not be saved. You will have to re-enter them even if you have done them before. If you're adding a new EIN because you've never filed for this school before, in the first box you are going to put in the first two digits of the EIN 
and then fill in the rest of the numbers in the second box. From there, you can go down and create a new filing. If you've filed before for a lot of other units, you can delete them by clicking on the delete box and then clicking delete EIN. Once you're on there, you select the EIN from the drop down menu and click continue. On this page, you're going to do your organization's details. You can only file for the current year. If you need to back file for a previous year, contact CAPTA's Tax Filing Support Center for sites you can do that at. Did you disband or go out of business? From the drop down, you'll say yes or no. Are your gross receipts normally $50,000 or less? Gross receipts are total receipts before expenses are deducted. You must have a three-year average of less than $50,000 to file a postcard. Don't forget, you can deduct your membership that does not belong to you that you send up through channels at this point. All PTAs in California have the same legal name. Don't change this line. Verify that the EIN is correct and click Continue. Next, they ask for the contact info. Here is where you should be including the name of your individual PTA in the DBA section. You're going to add the mailing address of your unit, not your personal address. And if your unit has a website, you can include it in this section. Next, they ask for principal officer information. In the first box, you should specify that the name is a person, not a business's name. Your principal officer is your president or your treasurer not the principal of your school. Fill in their home address, not the school's address, and then click Submit Filing. You will get a pop-up confirmation warning. This is just to make sure that you are 100% satisfied with what you've already input. If you are, click OK. If you need to go back and check, click Cancel. On the final page, you need to click where it says Note print a copy of this filing for your records. You can't go back later and print the official submission copy. The best you can do later is to print the IRS page that shows information from all of your postcard filings by date. What to do next? Print a copy for your treasurer's binder. Print a copy for the secretary's book. Upload a copy into My PT EZ for storage. Present a copy at your next executive board meeting so the board is aware that taxes have been filed. It is the entire board's responsibility to make sure taxes are filed every year. Alrighty. Do we have, Donna, do we have any questions in the chat? Hey, Lisa, this is Nanette. I did receive one question from uh, one of the participants as a private DM. Okay. And she just asked, uh, which dates are we filing taxes for? So can you clarify maybe the dates? Certainly. So um, PTA, all PTAs in 33rd District, their um, tax year, their fiscal year is from July 1st through June 30th. So that's what you're focusing on. And then... Um, that, those filings are due November 15th. Okay, and Lisa, there's another question. Uh, mm -hmm. We have both a president and treasurer. Whose address do we put as the principal officer? Either one is fine. I don't know that there's one that's necessarily better than the other. Okay. Uh, there's another question. How okay. do we figure out if we uh, average less than 50,000? Do we add up this year and the last two years and then find the average? That's precisely it. So um, it would be the 2022 through 23 year and then those two years before it. So that would be 2021 to 2022 and 2020 through 2021. So yes, those three years, um, and then you would total up your um, total receipts, your gross receipts and divide and find the average that way, yes. Okay, great, thanks Lisa. We have a couple more questions that are coming okay. in. Great job everybody with your questions. 
Uh, is this something the treasurer can file online or does this require a CPA? So the the 990N, the postcard for those who make less than, than 50,000, yes, it's very easy. It should not take you too much time if you have all your information handy. Um, the federal is really easy because, you know, you saw um, Laura just took us through it all. Um, basically, it's just logging in, putting in that information, and poof, you're done. <laughs> so, uh, no, don't don't pay a, a CPA uh, if you make less than fifty thousand and you're able to do the the postcard. If you make more than and you have to file the more complicated form, then yes, that's certainly something that's a valid PTA expense. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a comment. Don't use the school's address for the principal office. I think that was true, right? So let, I think let's go down to the next question. For clarification, is the period for this November filing July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023? Yes. Yes, okay, great. that is the next. correct period. Okay, great. Great questions, everyone. The next one, Lisa, is the link for the Tax Filing Support Center keeps taking me to a registration page even after I've logged in. Is it working? Uh, well, I think it's working. I, I'm not sure what issue you're running into as far as um, not being able to get onto that page or not being able to get away from the registration page. Um, I think- oh, clear cookies, maybe, someone said. <laughs> Oh, okay. That that's a good idea. Or um, if you try that and that still doesn't work, you can maybe email info at capta.org and let them know that you're having issues trying to register. Okay. Um, I, I want to go back to the address question. That was yes. a question, and we want to make sure we're clear is that when you're putting in the address, you're not putting in the school address, but a principal officer of your PTA, such as your PTA president or treasurer, their home address. Is that correct, Lisa? Yes, that's that's what uh, um, okay. was in the video. Yes. Okay. Does I that think answer I've your got... question? Yeah. I don't see any other questions Okay. at the moment. Okay, Alrighty. we'll keep going then. Thank you. Okay, so we can move on to the video for the 199N, which is filing for the state uh, tax return. Welcome to Grab and Go PTA, how to file a California 199N postcard. First, you need to gather your materials. You need the following items before you start. A copy of your annual financial report that is based on your final audit numbers. A copy of your bylaws or the tax filing checklist from CAPTA. You need to know your school's complete mailing address. And you need to know your principal officer's complete mailing address. You will be going to the Franchise Tax Board website to file this postcard. There is a direct link on the CAPTA.org Tax Filing Support Center page or you can Google File California 199N Postcard. Once you're there and you have all your materials, you're going to click Start Postcard. On the login page, you're going to enter your seven-digit entity number that is in your bylaws or is on the tax filing worksheet available from your district PTA. It is the same as your franchise tax board number. It is not your EIN, but you will need that too. Type in the characters you see to verify you're not a robot, and then click Log In. On the first page, you're going to verify your school name and entity number. Once you've clicked Continue, it'll take you to a page about your accounting period. Make sure you're using the correct fiscal year information for your school. Most schools in California are July 1st through June 30th. If you have old 199s to file, you can do it through the same website. You just need to adjust the fiscal year. Be aware the IRS does not allow you to backfile through their site. 
At the bottom of the page, it's going to ask you some questions. Are you a new unit? Have you disbanded? Did you change your fiscal year? From your annual report, round up your total gross receipts, not net, to the nearest dollar. Gross is your receipts before you've deducted expenses. Don't forget, though, you can deduct the membership not belonging to the unit that you pass up through channels. Are you refiling your taxes because something was incorrect? Then this is an amended return. No California PTA should have a 1023 or a 1024 form pending. This is for nonprofits that have not already received their 501c3 status. You already have one. You're going to click continue at the bottom to go to the next page. The next page asks for your federal entity information. This is where you're going to be filling in that EIN number from earlier. You're going to say what your business is doing business as for our EIN number. That is the PTA California Congress of Parents and Teachers. It will not allow you to fill in the complete name, but you can fill in as much as possible. If you have a website, you should fill it in right now. Next, we're going to ask for your mailing address. The first part is the entity's mailing address. Give the address of your school, not your personal address. If you need to specify a department or person, you can fill it in in the attention box. After you've filled in the entity's address, it asks for the principal officer's address. You have the option here of saying it's the same as the school's address, or you can fill in their home address. Either way, you're going to click Continue when you're done. The contact info refers to the person who is preparing this tax filing. Fill in the name and the phone number and click Continue. It gives you an opportunity now to review before you submit. Double check to make sure that all the information that you have put in is correct. At the bottom of the page, there is the scary thing that says perjury warning. All this is is verifying that to the best of your knowledge, you are using the correct numbers for this entity and that you are telling the truth about how much money this entity made. Once you have checked the box, click submit. Once you have submitted, you're going to get a confirmation page. Make sure you go down to the bottom and click print you need to have a copy of your filing because there is no searchable database of 199 forms. So if you forget to make a copy, there's no way to go back and get it later. Alrighty. Are there any questions, Donna? Okay, hold on, Lisa. Let me double check here. We got a couple questions. That's cap. Oh, that's you're writing that. That's okay. me. <laughs> so, uh, the question was so the DBA here is different than what we put in for DBA on 990N. If you do forget, okay, to make a well, copy, let me let me let me get away. Okay, that's two, uh, two separate ahead. questions. So, um, I actually, when I reviewed this, I actually had a question about that too because. Um, the DBA on the 990N is because the default entity name that they have on there is that PTA, California Congress, whatever, which um, is not what you use when you're uh, doing business. Um, and you would put, you know, whatever, 33rd District PTA or Petrero Heights PTA or whatever. Um, I am a little unclear as to why they put that why they put that PTA California Congress under the DBA on the 199N. Um, normally when I fill that the 199N out for entities, I just leave it blank because your your name that you usually use is already connected with that number. So um uh you know far be it for me to to <laughs> contradict uh captive but I, I'm I'm a little bit confused by that. So um, yes, they said something different, 
but I've been leaving it blank and uh, it's been fine. So, does that help you, Anna? So okay, um, leave it blank. So just leave it blank, basically. I, I've just been leaving it blank, yes. Okay. And then, and Donna Okay, was... the next question, Lisa. Yeah, can you mm -hmm. hear me? If you do yes. forget to make a copy, is there a way for you to get it? There is absolutely no way to access it. That's why uh, when Laura was doing this video, she said quadruple check <laughs> because there's there's no online database for 199Ns or 199 filings at all. I mean, I've been rummaging looking for that for years. It, there just isn't. For If for some reason you forget to make a copy of your 990N, your federal, yes, there's a way to actually access the information so that you have a proof that you filed, but there's there's nothing for 199N. So yeah, you, you gotta okay. be on your toes. All right. All right. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, we did have one go back in regards to what we are leaving blank in the prior discussion. We just wanted to double check okay. about that. Okay. So for the 199N, there is a, a spot for a DBA name, a doing business as name. That's what you can go ahead and leave blank. Okay, the doing business as. Okay, great. And then I'm sorry to keep yes. flip-flopping, but there is another question in regards <laughs> to, I think, getting a copy of the thing you said that we couldn't get a copy of. Nope, there not even the queen, can... Donna Broussard, she cannot either. If, yeah. Okay, you could see that. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> All right, great. Um, one more question, Alisa, in the chat. My PTSA's past returns have the school address for both the federal and state taxes. Is that a problem for the 990? I do not think it is a problem. I mean, I've I've been, you know, I sometimes I'll do filings for some of our smaller units and because I don't know the officer's personal address, I just go ahead and use a school address and it's not come up as a problem for me. <laughs> uh, I don't think it'll be a problem for your past returns. Okay, thanks for that clarification, Lisa. That's all the questions in the chat at the moment. Super, righty, then we can go ahead and move on to the CTTR1 video. Uh, again, I just want to mention that it's uh, from a couple years ago, so um, the form is mostly the same, but there is sort of a slightly different signature section. So if, if you're if you're filling out the CTTR one and you're freaked out because it's a little bit different than what's in the video, please don't don't worry about it. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Rita. Welcome to Grab and Go PTA, how to fill out the CT TR1 form for postcard filers. Gather your materials first. You should have the following items before you start. A copy of your annual financial report based on your final audit. A copy of your bylaws or the tax filing checklist from CAPTA. Know your school's complete mailing address. And information about any raffles you had during the tax filing year. This is a copy of what the CTTR1 form looks like. There is an online renewal system for the RRF1 and the CTTR1 form together available at the website below. You must be current with the Attorney General's Office to use the online system. Do not attempt to file any old forms that are missing through their system. The online system asks for the same information as the paper form does. On the California State PTA's website, under our Tax Filing Support Center, you will be able to download a file called the Annotated CTTR1 form. This will help you to fill out your unit's CTTR1 form. We will go through this step by step for this video. First, you're going to fill in the name of your PTA as it is shown on the front cover of your bylaws. Then you're going to fill in your PTA's physical address including your city 
and your state of California and your zip code. Then we are going to fill in our state charity registration number. Most PTAs in California start with CT and a string of numbers. If you have an older charity registration number, the CT may be missing. However, most of us do start with CT and some numbers. Then you're going to fill in your corporation or organization number. That is your franchise tax board number or your state tax ID number, as some people call it. Finally, your federal employer ID number or your EIN. All of these numbers are available in your bylaws near the back on the numbers page. Then you're going to fill in your annual accounting period. Most PTAs go from July 1st through June 30th. If your PTA has a different fiscal year, you need to verify it with your bylaws or your tax filing worksheet mentioned on the second slide. Double check to make sure you have the correct year included when you file the form. For the next sections, you're going to need your annual financial report. I'm going to start off in the assets section. Cash is your cash on hand that you use to pay your bills. It's your checking accounts, basically. If you have more than one checking account, you add them together to get the total. If you have a savings account, it would go in this section. Most PTAs do not have investments or own land or buildings, so we will skip that for today. Your other assets can be things like your value of your spiritware inventory, or if you own popcorn machines or other kinds of equipment, you put down the estimated value of them, and it will automatically total for you your total assets. On the next column in the liabilities section, the majority of PTAs run on a cash basis, not an accrual basis. So you don't usually have liabilities such as accounts payable, salary payable, or other liabilities. So most people, this entire section will be a zero. If you do have an accrual basis, so you have accounts payable, accounts receivable, you pay salaries, consult your tax professional for help on filling out this section. However, most units that have that situation make too much money to use the CTTR1 form anyways, because this is for postcard filers only, which means you make less than $50,000 a year. It will also auto total your total liabilities and then present a fund balance, which is the total assets less your total liabilities. Your total assets will be taken from this worksheet and put onto your RRF1 form, which we discuss in a separate video, and we will touch on briefly at the end of this one. For the revenue statement section, you still need your annual financial report. We're going to start with your revenue, which is cash contributions. That is your membership dues, excluding the portions of the dues that you sent up through channels. Only the part of the membership that stays at your unit, council, or district is included in cash contributions. If you got cash donations, that is included. If you got gift cards donated to you, the value of the gift cards is included in the cash contributions. Non-cash contributions are things like water for a jogathon, items for a gift basket for an auction or a raffle. Program revenue, that's things that generate income that you consider a program. If you consider Spiritwear sales a program rather than a fundraiser, it would be included in here. If you sell yearbooks, if you have a family fun night that's not a fundraiser but more like a movie night and it generates incidental income, that is included in program revenue. As we said earlier, most PTAs do not have investments, so we will skip that one and go to special events. For the Attorney General's Office, special events are your fundraisers. 
So if you have a fundraiser, if you have a raffle, if you have an auction, anything that's generating money that's not program related or cash contribution related is probably a fundraiser. And then they have other revenue. If you generate other revenue, that is something that does not fall into any of the other categories, you will be attaching an itemized list, which we will discuss on another slide. It will automatically total up your revenue for you. And then we switch over to expenses. PTAs do not compensate officers and directors. This is not a spot to put in things where you have reimbursed somebody on your board for expenses they incurred. This is for if you had officers that were paid for something as a salary. We also generally don't compensate staff. If you do, you should consult your tax professional about what to fill in there. Fundraising expenses, however, are any expenses related to what they call special events over on the revenue side. So if you have costs involved in your fundraising, you had to purchase items for a carnival, you had to put out uh, mailers, you had to pay portion of a book fair if you don't consider the book fair a program. Those kind of things go in fundraising expenses. Generally, PTAs do not pay rent or utilities, so we are skipping that and going to supplies and postage. That is stuff from your administrative section of your budget, generally fall under supplies and postage, such as buying a case of paper for the PTA to use. Stamps for general PTA use, not that are specific to an event. That kind of thing is probably under supplies and postage. Anything you use for your PTA operations. Next, we go to insurance. The insurance for most people will just be that one rate that everybody pays. If you have additional costs, like you had an event that required additional insurance to be purchased, or if you are one of the units, councils, or districts, that hires an independent contractor who does not carry their own workers' comp insurance. That might be included. You lump it all together for your insurance. And then finally, there's other expenses. That's basically everything else that you spend money on. Usually program, that's 99% of it, but it will need to be listed, itemized on another sheet of paper, which we will discuss in a moment. The form auto totals your expenses, and then it will tell you what your net revenue at the end is, which is your total revenue less your total expenses. The total revenue line will be used on the RRF1 form, and we will discuss that at the end of this presentation. Next, you go to supplemental information. If you answered yes to any of the questions on the RRF1, you'll need to explain them. You also need to explain other revenue from the CTTR1 form and other expenses from the CTTR1 form. You need to provide an itemized list for each of these scenarios. There is no exact format for the information. It is easiest to just do it on a Word or Google document. An example of what it might look like is on this slide. You entitle it supplemental information. You put your PTA's name on it. Put what the fiscal year end is. Include your government numbers. That way, if this form somehow gets separated from the other parts of the form, they will be able to track it down and put it back for you. In this sample, they did not have any other revenue, but they did have other expenses. And you'll see they listed the amount of the expense and the budget line item. Now we'll transfer our items back to the RRF1 form. In the first section, you're going to put in your full accounting period. As a reminder, for most PTAs in California, that will be July 1st of one year 
ending on June 30th of the following year. In the gross annual revenue, we are going to take the total from our revenue section of the CTTR1 form. In our sample, it was $26,405. Then we are going to put in zero for our non-cash contributions because on our sample, we did not have any. And our total assets were $8,452. We leave the program expenses blank because it's already reflected on the form. And then we fill in our total expenses, in this case, $24,322. The final step is you need to once again sign as the authorized agent, either the president or the treasurer, print your name, your title, and date it. Remember, you are just saying to the best of your belief, the content is true, correct, and complete, and you are authorized to sign. If you're filing the RRF1 online, you will then be prompted to upload a copy of this. Otherwise, you're going to be mailing a copy of both the RRF1 and the CTTR1 form, along with the filing fee, to the AG's office. You will then upload the RRF1 and CTTR1 form and any supplemental materials as one file to my PTEZ. Alrighty. So, are there any questions regarding the CTTR1? All right, here is your question. If the program expenses are already included, what is the example of what you would put in that line? So program expenses is probably basically anything you spend on behalf of the kids. So maybe field trips, assemblies, um, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I did lose Wi-Fi for a minute, so I'm not sure if I missed yeah. one. There is one more. Um, one question that came through is, does PTA operation, in quotes, include postage fees for mailing spirit wear from online sales, or does that expense go under fundraising? Yeah, I think for if if the postage fees are very specific to like an event or some some kind of program, then you would fold it into like if you're using spirit wear as a fundraiser and you have shipping costs or, or uh, mailing costs, then I would say that that postage belongs kind of with that, wherever you're, you're putting your expenses for your spirit wear. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and launch a poll, but you know, if you guys think of any other questions, then feel free to plop them in the chat. Alrighty, here's a quick one question poll. Alrighty, I'm gonna give it about 10 more seconds. Alrighty, ending, sharing results. Alrighty, well, here's the thing. This was kind of a trick question <laughs> because we spent so much time talking about CTTR1s, but not all PTA units have to submit a CTTR1. If they are those PTAs that average more than 50,000 a year, and they are submitting either a 990-EZ or a 990, they would actually be submitting a copy of that instead of the CTTR1. But for um, those who are uh, making less than 50,000 a year and are filing the e-postcard, the 990N, then um, those units would need to file the CTTR1 along with the RRF1 form. And I'm guessing that a lot of, of you here are falling in that category. So um, 
maybe it's an unfair question, but we just want to make sure that to, to clarify that it is specifically for those who make less than 50,000. All righty. All right. Thanks, Lisa. That's a really good poll question, keeping us on our toes. There's a couple more <laughs> questions in the chat. Um, let's okay. see. If we have fundraising spirit wear expense pending, a check to pay for the spirit wear, wear not yet cash, does that go on accounts payable or other liability? If we have an expense. Okay, um, you may need to clarify this um, because since PTA, uh, since we are generally cash accounting, if you've actually issued the check, then whether it's been cashed or not, then it it's doesn't go under accounts payable or other liability. But if I'm misunderstanding your question, then uh, um, either speak up or add more in the chat. Okay, yeah, so um, yeah, yes, check was issued, not cashed. That okay, was okay, so yeah, whether a vendor cashes your check or not, that doesn't affect whether you put it as a, a liability or accounts payable. You may want to contact them just to see <laughs> if if uh, they have lost your check and need it reissued. There was another. OK, so like more clarification on that question. So then we don't put amount under either. Correct. Is that correct, Lisa? Right. So that that check, that floating check, it's in limbo somewhere. That amount doesn't go under under accounts payable or liability. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. We were able to answer that question. Okay, the next question, is there a dollar amount that shifts a program to fundraiser? There's not really a dollar amount. I think it's more the intent of, of the event kind of thing. It's like, oh, well, if, if it's uh, an event where you're you're intending to to make money, then that would be a fundraiser. If it's something where maybe you're providing it more as a service for the kids, like maybe you have some kind of carnival, but you're just looking to break even, then that could be a program. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, Lisa, right now there are no further questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you from the um, okay the team. Alrighty. Okay. Yeah, and, keep typing in your questions. Uh, everybody's doing a great job. Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> All righty. So the next uh, video would be the RRF1 video. Um, and just so you know, the form on this video is a couple years old. So it's got a different fee structure on there. So, uh, but the handouts that you have uh, reflect the, the current form. So, um, if you see numbers that look a little different than expected, then ignore the details that are on the, the form as far as the fee structure is concerned. And Rita, I'll stop blabbing and you can kick it off. Hello, and welcome to Grab and Go PTA, how to fill out the RRF1 form. First, you're gonna gather your materials. You should have the following items before you start a copy of your annual financial report based on your final audit, a copy of your bylaws or the tax filing checklist from CAPTA, know your school's complete mailing address, and information about any raffles you had during the tax filing year. This is an example of what the RRF1 form looks like. There is an online renewal system available at the website below. You must be current with the Attorney General's office to use their online system. Do not attempt to file old forms through their online system. It will be rejected. The online system asks for the same information as the paper form, which we will be going over in this presentation. On the California State PTA website, 
we have a Tax Filing Support Center. On this page, you can find a copy of the annotated version of the RRF1 form that will enable you to fill out the one for your unit correctly. The first thing you're going to need to do is fill in the name of your PTA as it says on the front of your bylaws. If at some point in the past you have used a different name for your PTA under the same EIN number, you would fill it in here. You will put in the street address, your city, California, and your zip code, the school's phone number or your personal phone number, and an email address that you can be reached at should they have any problems with the form. If this is a change of address for this PTA, or you are filling out an amended report, you would check off the boxes here. Then you're going to fill in your identification numbers. Your state charity registration number is the CT number. It starts, for most of us, with the letter CT, although some of our older units may just have a single number. Then you're going to do your corporation or organization number. That is your franchise tax board number or your California tax ID number, as some people say it. And finally, you're going to fill in your EIN number, which is your IRS number. Then you're going to look at the table and see if you're going to have any renewal fees. That will come into play at the very end. In the second part of the form, you're going to be filling in the following information. You're going to be putting in what the accounting period was. For most of us in California, that starts on July 1st and ends on June 30th. Make sure you have the correct years filled in as well. Then you're going to be filling in your gross annual revenue. If you are filing a 990N, which is the postcard, you're going to be getting that from a different form called the CTTR1 form. If you file a 990, it's the line 12, or if you file a 990EZ, it is line 9. On this line, we fill in non-cash contributions. That's things that you have gotten donated for you, for like an auction or for a jogathon, such as water or items for gift baskets. This is just an estimate of the retail value of those items. It's not included in your annual revenue. Then you're going to list your total assets. Your total assets generally are the total of all of your bank balances at the end of the fiscal year, which for this form would be June 30th. If you have other assets, they may be included in here. If you fill out the 990N postcard, you will be leaving the program expenses line blank. If you fill out the 990 or the 990EZ, you will look through the instructions that are provided and add your program expenses on this line. And finally, your total expenses. If you filed the 990N postcard, your total expenses will be on that form CTTR1. Otherwise, you'll be looking at your instructions for your 990 or your 990EZ. On this section of the form, there are nine questions that require a yes or no answer. If you answer yes to some of them, you may need to provide additional information. Number one is asking, during this reporting period, were there any contracts, loans, leases, or financial transactions between the organization and any officer, director, or trustee thereof, either directly or with an entity in which an officer or director or trustee had a financial interest? This is almost always a no answer and should be answered by looking at your conflict whistleblower forms, which are also a requirement under IRS regulations. During this reporting period, was there any theft, embezzlement, diversion, or misuse of the organization's charitable property or funds? This is usually a no, unless you had to file a police report for one of those incidences. During this reporting period, were any organization funds used to pay any penalties, fines, or judgments? 
That would be if you got a fine from the IRS or the AG or the Franchise Tax Board or you were being sued for some reason. This is very rarely a yes answer. During this reporting period were the services of a commercial fundraiser, fundraising council for charitable purposes, or a commercial co-venturer used. Occasionally, PTAs enter into agreements with commercial fundraising companies. These are not things like your uh, wrapping paper fundraiser or a cookie dough fundraiser. These are specifically fundraisers that have a person going out and raising funds on your behalf and then they may take a flat fee or a percentage of the donations. During this reporting period, did the organization receive any governmental funding? Most PTAs, that is always a no. During this reporting period, did the organization hold a raffle for charitable purposes? If you held a raffle, you need to make sure you have a raffle registration and have sent in your raffle report and you may in addition be asked for the dates of the raffle and what the proceeds were. Does the organization conduct a vehicle donation program? That is generally speaking a no for PTAs. Did the organization conduct an independent audit and prepare audited financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles for this reporting period? For most PTAs, that is a no. Our audit is actually a financial review and is not done under what is called GAAP procedures or principles. Unless you paid somebody, and it's generally a large amount of money to pay one, to have an audit done for some reason, the answer should be no. At the end of this reporting period, did the organization hold restricted net assets while reporting negative unrestricted net assets? That should be a no from most PTAs. We generally don't hold restricted net assets because we are on a cash basis and we do not have a accounting system that would allow for that. Now that you're done with the RRF1, you have a few final steps. Are there any questions about RRF1s? Yes, Lisa, we do have one question in the chat. Okay. Will there be a training for PT? Oops. You dropped out, Donna. Will there be a training? Okay. I can jump well, in um, in absence of Donna, but you don't know what I'm going to say next. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, will there be a training for PTAs that make over 50000 If not, um, and we have specific questions, who should we send those to? Thanks, Nan. No, there... Sorry. <laughs> good? No, there won't be a training for PTAs that make over fifty k. Um, in, in that case, since there will be, you would need to file either the 990-EZ or the 990 form. Uh, you may need to um, get uh, pay for uh, an accountant's services to take care of that. And then they could be answering your specific questions. Um, just to throw in a note that if you do um, need to use an accountant's services, make sure that they are familiar with nonprofits and nonprofit accounting. Um, I, if, if you want to stick around after we are done with the main part of the training, you can throw your questions my way. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them because um, I'm not sure how specific they are, but um, well, if you can keep them until after we're done at around 7.25 or 7.30, then I'll be sticking around. Okay, thanks, Lisa. There's no further questions in the chat, but I know you're very responsive to your uh, PTA email if people have questions even after this training. Right, exactly. So, yes, yeah, so our, well, we'll be mentioning this later, but our contact information is on the handout that we sent out. So, if you have anything you need to send to us, then let us know. And then I will then launch into, there's a few more. Uh, 
pages of the handout. Now, this is specifically for uh, PTAs that are incorporated. Oops. Yeah. Uh, PTAs that are incorporated. Um, if you're incorporated, and you can tell by going to your bylaws and seeing if you have a, a corporation ID number. So yay for bylaws, all that information is there in a handy spot. Uh, if you are incorporated, then every two years, which is really annoying because it's just long enough for you to forget to do it. Every two years, you're supposed to file an SI-100. Um, and it's very simple. It's basically just asking for the contact information of your main officers, your, your president, your treasurer, your uh, secretary. Um, which years they're due depend on when your PTA was incorporated. So if you were incorporated in an odd year, then you're, you need to file in every odd year. And then also which month it's due is dependent on when your um, when you are incorporated. So if you are incorporated in July 1955, then every odd year in July, this SI-100 is going to be due. Um, the um, handout has links to, uh, you can either do a hard copy form, which is available as a PDF, the first link, or you can actually file online. And that's actually quicker if you're willing to you know, just use your credit card and get reimbursed for that $20 fee. Um, that way you can know that uh, immediately that it was filed. Um, I know that in the past, sometimes the paper forms take a while for them to be, get processed. Okay. Um, for letters of determination, sometimes either a bank might ask you for a letter of determination or proof that you're a uh, nonprofit, um, or um, maybe someone who's planning on making a, a donation to you might want this, this proof. Um, in this case, um, the president of your unit, of your PTA, would contact California State PTA to request a copy. And the address is there, LOD, which is short for Letter of Determination, at CAPTA.org. Um, so, the one thing uh, about this is that your PTA has to be in good standing with the attorney general to for um, CAPTA to, to issue the letter to you. So um, make sure that you're on top of your RRF ones because uh, if you fall if you're delinquent there, then you won't be able to get an LOD of letter of determination. Okay. Nonprofit raffles. Um, this tends to spur a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot of information on the Attorney General's website at that uh, link there. Um, but just uh, a few things. If you are selling tickets for a chance to win a prize, then that's a raffle. Um, normally, uh, raffles are generally not allowed, but the state of California has sort of carved out an exception for nonprofits for them to be able to fundraise using raffles, but there are certain guidelines that you need to follow. One is that you need to register every year. Um, and the registration year, it used to be September through August, but it's changed to January through December. So you can register once for each year, and you can have as many raffles as you want within that year that you've registered for. And then after that year is over, then you need to file uh, a raffle report form. And that would be due to the AG's office on February 1st. Um, and the registration fee is $30. So um, just make sure that if you're going to have a raffle, um, Make sure that you have your raffle registration uh, ready, even prior to selling tickets or publicizing. Um, the website currently says that you should um, submit your application at least 60 days before um, the 
uh, scheduled date for your raffle activities, which include selling tickets. So make sure you plan ahead. Um, it, even though it is a January through December year, you may not know until into January. So you don't necessarily have to file the application before January, but just make sure you allow plenty of time before any raffles that you plan for. And let's see. And just want to make sure that everyone is aware of uh, California State PTA's Tax Filing Support Center. They have all kinds of links there, links to the tax forms. And actually, um, farther down on this page is actually links to the videos that we just shared. So if you need to watch it again to you know drill down to um, something that you may have missed, then that's available there. And I'm going to stop sharing. And um, were there questions that popped up? Donna? Okay, Lisa. Yeah, we have, um, let's see, one question on this section so far. Were we able to get clarification on that if we give tickets to members raffle? Okay, so um, for for those of uh, you who don't know what Anna is talking about, there um, there was a question about if you, um, as an incentive for people to join your PTA, if you say, oh, okay, you join our PTA, you pay the membership dues, and then we'll enter you into a drawing. So uh, right now, that's kind of a gray area. I had been trying to contact the California State PTA Treasurer, but I think there's sort of some turnover going there. So there isn't anyone officially in that spot. So right now, I do not have a definitive answer. Um, I, I would say... If you want to be on the safe side, then go ahead and register because it's only $30. <laughs> but um, if you have more additional questions, then maybe we can take them after. And then I can see if I can find someone up at CAPTA that can, can answer anything that I'm not able to answer. Okay, thank you, Lisa. There's no further questions in the chat at this moment. Okay, well, then I will do my favorite activity and toss up another poll. All righty. I think this is a little unfair because I may not have actually gone over <laughs> this fact, but feel free to... Throw your best guesses out there. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end this because this is my fault. I should have uh, remembered this. Okay. True or false? A raffle permit allows the unit to have an online raffle program. And... Actually, the answer is false. You know, for those of you who answered true, totally not your fault because <laughs> you didn't mention that uh, while I was going over that information. Um, but yes, you can publicize it online. You can say, you know, you can say what the prizes are and how much the tickets are and, the, you know, what the dates of ticket sales are, but you cannot actually sell tickets online that needs to be done in in person um hey lisa i did get a question a, a, another private dm i apologize uh, the question was oh, i no had problem. asked um i could i had asked if you can please repeat differences in filing example ct uh cr1 which i think they meant the ct well i don't know i always get the acronyms and the 990 so i guess looking for yeah repeat differences in filing that might need some clarification here. I'm going to repost it and maybe uh, you can tell me if this makes sense. Yeah. I had asked if you can repeat differences in filing example, the CTCR1 and the 990. Okay. So 
okay, maybe can the person who asked that question, if they can clarify that, I can guess, and I'm gonna guess that um, the 990N, that's the e-postcard that you can file if your unit, if your PTA has made an average of less than $50,000. If you're filing that form, that's it's basically doesn't really ask you that much information. It just says, do you normally make less than $50,000? And on that, you don't have any breakdown of, of how you got your money or how you spent your money. So that's the reason why if you're filing that federal e-postcard, they want you to, the state of California wants you to fill out the CTTR1 because that sort of breaks down, you know, how you earned your money, how you spent your money, um, and actually gives a specific dollar amount of um, what your revenue was. So if you make more than the 50,000 and you're, and you're filing with the IRS, the 990EZ or the 990, that's got all that the details because it asks all kinds of questions and you're filing a copy of that along with your RRF1. And so that lets the state of California know, okay, this is how much you made and this is um, how you, you know, what your revenue sources were and how you spent your money. So I'm hoping that's the gist of your question. If it's something totally different, then feel free to, um, you know, know, explain further in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and uh, explain if that's easier. And in the meantime, I'm gonna say, are there any other questions? Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Lisa. Uh, right now, there are no further questions in the chat. Okay, because you know, you've got most of the financial team here <laughs> waiting to help you. <laughs> All righty, then Lizette, why don't you go ahead and close it out and we'll stay online for if anyone thinks of any other questions that they have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And, uh, well, we hope this training has been helpful. And remember, for all for more information about PTA um, tax filings, uh, please contact your council financial team or our website is 33rdpta.org um, or California State PTA website. It's capta.org. Um, also, all, the, all our um, contact information, it's on the second slide on, on this handout. Also, I see on the chat, the, the websites that I just mentioned. And thank you everybody for joining. Have a good night. Good night.